Well, good morning. My name is Jordan. As I may have mentioned, I'm an intern here. Hi, at Gray Saskatoon. And if you're just picking up on this series with us, I want to welcome you. Uh, we're studying a letter to the early church in a book called James, to these early Jewish believers living away from their homes, their familiar places, and even away from their pastor. See, they are a part of this first church in Jerusalem, but they had to suddenly leave due to persecution. These early believers grew up under the law of Moses, but see, James was trying to help them to learn to live under grace in light of this gospel. And that's why this letter is written to his beloved scattered flock. And in a way, I kind of get it. I say I kind of get it, where these believers are coming from. See, where I went to school, there was a lot of rules among many. And one that stuck out to me was how our hair was maintained. It was our duty to obey these rules. Now, here I'm not quite 40 years old, and my hairstyle really hasn't changed in length. Now, I've graduated from that school. I'm not a part of that system anymore. I don't even know if they have rules about hair anymore. And after all these years, I have no luscious locks to show of. After all these years of being out of that system of do's and don'ts. And so I kind of get it. Because it's so easy to think that following the same rules day after day and not even really think about what's driving that belief. But the gospel changes everything. Now, my short hair doesn't compare to the persecution and, and changes the early church was facing, but to these early Jewish believers who grew up under the law, you have to understand, this gospel of grace is completely new. James wants them to see that this gospel life is driven not by duty, but by love. The love by which they have been loved by Jesus and with this sudden persecution, they've been thrown into the deep end because they're no longer be, are, are able to be taught by their pastors except through a letter like what we're going to go through today. This persecution and difficult time was actually furthering Jesus' purpose and having the gospel witness move beyond Jerusalem to Judea, then Samaria, and to the ends of the earth, including where you're sitting today. So the author writes a letter. James wants to center them on their identity in what Jesus has done, this gospel, and how to rightly respond to the challenges, the change, and these trials. See, the author doesn't want them to succumb to the temptation to doubt the goodness of God in it all. In fact, suffering and the cross are part of this new covenant kingdom. In chapter one of this letter, where we find ourselves, James has been laying out for us how to respond to these trials, how to respond to the temptation. And today we'll continue to hear how to respond to this truth they have received, this precious gospel, this word, this working faith implanted within us. So why don't we listen to our scripture video and then we'll dig in. A reading from James chapter 1, verses 22 through 27. But be doers of the word, and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he's like a man who looks intently at his natural face in a mirror. For he looks at himself and goes away and at once forgets what he was like. But the one who looks into the perfect law, the law of liberty, and perseveres, being no hearer who forgets, but a doer who acts, he will be blessed in his doing. If anyone thinks he is religious and does not bridle his tongue, but deceives his heart, this person's religion is worthless. Religion that is pure and undefiled before God the Father is this, to visit orphans and widows in their affliction, and to keep oneself unstained from the world. All right. Well, I'm not sure if you're celebrating Thanksgiving today or tomorrow, but I want to paint a picture for you, okay? Tomorrow, you've invited our family over to share in a Thanksgiving meal. As we arrive and take off our jackets, you notice I'm wearing a sweater with a turkey on it, and he's holding a fork and knife. And above his little head, it's got the word bubble that says gobble, gobble. It seems fitting for the occasion. My daughter hands you a craft she made. A picture of us all sitting around the table eating turkey. 
that's pretty cute. And as we wait for the final preparations to be made, while there's no CFL Classic, so instead we watch one of those interesting cooking shows on how to cook a turkey. You can brine it, broil it, deep fry it, stuff butter up the skin, make it with stuffing outside, inside, or both. In those 20 minutes, we learn every different method to prepare a turkey. Finally, the table is set, and as we get settled, my oldest son asks if he can recite some poetry. He stands up and his first line begins, mm-mm, turkey and pie, mm-mm, if I don't get some soon, I'm gonna die. He goes on for a few more minutes on the merits of cranberry sauce, stuffing, and why pumpkin pie with whipped cream is the, ble- is the best. We laugh and we applaud. As is your tradition, we take a moment to go around the table and share what we're thankful for. Finally, as the host, ready to carve the turkey, you pray over the meal. As you close your prayer with an amen, you notice I'm getting up from the table, but not just me and my turkey sweater. No, my whole family is getting up and we're going to the door. We're putting on our shoes and jacket. Thank you so much for having us over, I say. That meal smells so good. I look forward to when we do this again. And we walk out the door. With the smell of that uneaten Thanksgiving dinner lingering in the air, you are in complete and utter shock. They didn't even eat the turkey. They missed the meal. Now this, of course, would never happen. I know this for a fact, I know my children, but yet it happens in many churches each Sunday. People dress the part, their children make cute crafts, they see videos about the gospel, they may even hear the gospel. They follow the traditions expected in that particular setting, they might even say the words, amen. But they miss the meat of the gospel. James is going to go on to warn us to not be hearers of what Jesus has done only. Obviously, you know, let's be clear, hearing is important, but he doesn't want it to stop there. So he describes the danger of being hearers only and calls us to be gospel doers of this word. This this text is a check engine light for us all. See, trials expose what we really love and prioritize, But our response to this word, which is ultimately our response to Jesus, exposes what we believe is really true about the reality of this gospel. Sometimes what we think we believe or what we convince ourselves we believe is not what we really believe at the core of our being. We can deceive ourselves. And what we do exposes that reality. Now look at verse 22 if you have your Bible. Or your app which is just a click away. But be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. The author begins by encouraging us to live out this word we profess and not simply listen to it. But what is this word? Earlier, James has called it the word of truth. Then we heard previously that he calls it the implanted word. That saves us. Now, in this next chapter, James will explain this word as the royal law of liberty. This word is the gospel, the good news that Jesus Christ, God's Son, dies for our sin and rises again, forever triumphing over his enemies. So now there is no condemnation for those who believe, but only ever increasing joy in a new covenant love relationship with our Heavenly Father. Jesus has done for us what we can never do for ourselves. He has established a new covenant. Now, it's new not because it's a new list of rules to do, but because it's a whole new way to relate to God. And because of this new covenant relationship, we have experienced love at a whole new level. This new covenant love relationship Jesus brings us into gives us a completely different meaning of the word love. To love others with the same quality and magnitude as Jesus has loved us. Wow. James is saying here, 
by being called to be gospel doers, we are not driven by duty, a desire to be blessed or even out of guilt. No, instead, we are driven by love with which we have been loved by Christ. When we look to Jesus and remind ourselves what he has already done, we are driven by love to do what he says. We're driven by love to obey this word, to yield our preference, just as Jesus has done for us. Even our comfort for his glory, to love others the way Jesus has loved us. Now, here we see James is going to show us a comparison of religion as the original hearers know it, and what he calls here true religion. Or we could say, doing out of done, all our doing flows out of what Jesus has already done for us. Now, that word religion, it might have triggered some of you. Maybe you've heard this phrase or even said something like it. True gospel Christianity is a relationship, not a religion. See, because we've been conditioned to hear the word religion, and think of it as a negative term. James is using this term to wake up his listeners to what true religion is in contrast to what most religions were aware of, which he's going to show us later on in the text. The original listeners already knew the religion of the Ten Commandments as given by Moses as they grew up under the law. Not only did they have to obey some 613 rules as Jews living under the law, but the Jewish leaders kept on adding more rules to keep you from breaking the other rules. They had rules for everything. And if all this message was about was simply hearing and just doing those rules, we'd leave here today without eating the turkey. We'd miss this gospel doing that James is talking about here. See, they had heard the law so many times growing up but could never perfectly obey it. The law of Moses was about coming to God on God's terms. But who could do that? Certainly not me. But there was one perfect doer who did. Jesus Christ, God's son. He comes to live life on earth, fully God, fully man, and does what we could never do. He lives a sinless, perfect life. He willingly lays it down as a perfect sacrifice, and he rises triumphantly from the dead. He brings us all the way to God in this new covenant love relationship. Look, this is what James is saying in verse 22. I want you to be doers of this word out of what Jesus has already done. See, the religion of the original listeners knew demanded obedience to the rules, but it wasn't driven by love. It, was, it wasn't driven by what Jesus has already done. But this true religion that James is going to show us is about true worship from the heart and not simply the lips. In the same way, we should want to be hearers of the word, but not hearers only. We should also want to honor God with our lips, but not our lips only. It's very possible to be religious and yet miss the incredible life-changing reality of what Jesus has done, this implanted word that saves us. Jesus put it this way, these people honor me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. These people do the right things, they even say the right things, but the driving factor is not from a heart transformed by the love of Jesus. And James is saying that very thing here in verse 22. Look at verse 22 again. He warns us. Hearers only deceive themselves. That's why this type of religion, what the original hearers knew, is so deceptive. Because it knows the facts of what's true. But in the end, it misses the meat of the gospel. It misses what Jesus has already done. Knowing the grocery store has groceries doesn't take away your hunger. Knowing the bank has money in their vault doesn't make you rich. And only hearing facts about the gospel does not make one a doer of this gospel word. See, a doer becomes, over time, 
Now, for time's sake, there's some scriptures on the screen. There's two verses there. But I want to look at the first one in John 14, 15. Look at that verse. By a strong sense of duty, a dash of religious guilt, and sheer personal willpower, we will keep his commandments. Doesn't say that, does it? No, it doesn't. It's okay. You can answer that question. See, we will grow as gospel doers by looking at the perfect doer, Jesus, and his perfect and complete work in his life, death, and resurrection. Then we will do, not driven by love, or not driven by duty, but driven by love. Responding in repentance and obedience, not simply doing, hearing only. If you love me, you will keep my commandments. See, this is doing out of done. Now look at 2 Corinthians 3.18. It's on the screen. It says this, And we all, with unveiled face, beholding the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from one degree of glory to another. For this comes from the Lord, who is the Spirit. What transforms us into the image of Jesus, growing one more degree to another? It's beholding him. Yes, it's beholding his glory as seen in this gospel of grace. It's beholding him on the cross for us, conquering sin, Satan, death, and hell. When you really look at what he's done, that, that'll change you. This is what verse 23 and verse 25 are leading to. Take a look. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he's like a man who looks intently at his natural face in a mirror. For he looks at himself and goes away and at once forgets what he was like. Now, mirrors don't look the same as they do now, but their function was always the same and, and they had to be maneuvered in the light for the image to be seen. Likewise, we can hear the gospel. We can know where all the right verses are. We can even have a, a deep knowledge of the Bible. And possibly we can even hold our own in a theological debate. But what we really believe is exposed by our lives. Or what we do after we're done looking in this mirror. We can come into this theater Sunday after Sunday Hear the word, be convicted at that very moment, and even take really, really good notes. But on the ride home, we can fall back into our old patterns of not doing what has convicted us even moments earlier. It says in verse 24 that he looks at himself and goes away and at once forgets what he was like. See, the hearer can be shown the wonders of the gospel. He can be challenged. He can be convicted with the word. He can be shown and shown the biggest and most transforming truth in Jesus. But look in your Bible. It says this. At once, it says. Maybe it's lunch. Maybe it's a new show on Netflix. Maybe it's a game he wants to play. He forgets. Now, we all forget but this seems to be intentional because it remains at an intellectual level. And so the love and grace shown to him in the gospel of Jesus does not transform his heart. But look at verse 25. This is the good part. This is an invitation to change. But the one who looks into the perfect law, the law of liberty. The word looks means to stoop down. There's intention in stooping down. It's humble. It's careful. It's with meekness, as we saw in verse 21. This is a whole new law. Nothing like the old covenant where you had to do in order to be blessed or you had to do in order to avoid the curse. No, this law of liberty is true freedom established by Jesus. This perfect law is us doing out of what Jesus has done for us. James tells us that when we look at this perfect law, we will see our sinless Savior that was broken for our sin. And that now brings us into fellowship with God, this God the Father in a new covenant love relationship. He gives us a new heart with a new law to follow, 
a perfect law, a royal law of love that frees us from our natural self-orientation and points us to Jesus. See, this is true freedom. Freed from being absorbed with self, we're now free to be doers as a loving and grateful response because we have been loved. We do out of what has been done. See, that's true freedom. As opposed to the Mosaic law the original listeners grew up under that condemned sinners and all fell under its curse. God the Father credits us with his son, Jesus, perfect obedience and enables us to obey his word by the power of the Holy Spirit. This is a whole new and different way for a Christian to live. A doer who now does out of love for all that Jesus has done for us in the gospel. That's doing out of done. Verse, verse 25 continues. It says, and he perseveres. See, this gospel doer, he perseveres. He keeps going. Why? Because he's beholding Jesus and he's staying close to that word. Because this right here, this is true freedom. Yes, trials come. Yes, temptation knocks. And they likely expose his own sinfulness, but he doesn't stop there. He perseveres because he's motivated by this royal law of love. Religion will only get you so far being driven by guilt. But the perfect law of true religion, as James will call it later, it never ends. Yet, this brings up an interesting tension in the Christian life. We are forgiven, and yet we sin because we choose to believe the promises of sin. So are we forgetful or forgiven? Well, the only way the power of sin can be broken in our lives is by the presence of power, presence and power of something far superior. And that is only found in the person of Jesus. That's why we need to look into this perfect law daily, because that faith works. It will persevere. Christian maturity is not marked by the infrequency of temptation, but by the infrequency of succumbing to temptation. We may fall, but the Holy Spirit will convict us until we become obedient doers of this word. What an awesome helper we've been given in this new covenant love relationship. Verse 25 ends, being no hearer who forgets, but a doer who acts. He will be blessed in his doing. See, a doer who obeys the word is a person whose faith works, not trusting in his works, but in Jesus' finished, complete work, doing out of done. Now let's dig into the last two verses. Verse 26. If anyone thinks he's religious. Now, I think we've thoroughly examined the hearer, and their response to the truth. But James is going to give us a few more examples before we hit the road. And then he's going to show us what true religion before God looks like. It's a faith that leads to action. It's a faith that works. Now, just to be clear, this list isn't exhaustive, okay? Because the author is wanting to move his listeners from rule-based living to relationship living under this royal law of love. And James is saying that this law of Christ is far superior to the old covenant. It doesn't just not murder. No, it doesn't even hate. Instead, it loves even one's enemies. So if anyone thinks he's living out this law of Christ, the author suggests putting this religion to the test in three different ways. And he's going to come back to him later on in this letter too. So let's look at the rest of verse 26. If anyone thinks he is religious and does not bridle his tongue, but deceives his heart, this person's religion is worthless. Well, tell us what you really think, James. Martin Luther said this, a religion that gives nothing, costs nothing, and suffers nothing is worth nothing. Here we see the opposite of hearing isn't talking because Hearers can already do that. 
When we speak, we expose what's really in our hearts. And as we live, our work exposes what's really in our hearts. So a heart truly humbled by this gospel will lead to a, a humility of having the gospel do its work in us. A humility that will be expressed in our speech, online, on the phone, in text, or in person. The mark of a doer, one truly living out this experience of the gospel, is bridling that tongue of ours, restraining it in silence, and controlling it in gracious, gracious speech when required. Simply put, one who has experienced the grace of Jesus is gracious to others. Our tongue will be bridled, James says, like a horse is bridled for the, uh, for the control of the rider. So we need the one who bridled his tongue to bridle ours. So doing the word is yielding the reins of our tongues into the nailed, scarred hands of our master and savior, Jesus. Listen to what Isaiah says about Jesus. This will be on the screen. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. Like a lamb led to the slaughter, and like a sheep before its shear is silent, so he opened not his mouth. And this is exactly what happens. Jesus stands before the authorities, and he accepts our guilty sentence in silence. Did you catch that? He was silent because our lips have already given more than enough evidence of our guilt. And yet... He bore the sin of my lips and my tongue on the cross, silent as my perfect offering. My lamb led to the slaughter. He knew exactly what he was doing each time he stood before those authorities, and he silently accepted the sentence of my guilt. No one took his life from him. He humbly laid it down of his own accord. This is what Jesus has done. How awesome. Are you ready for verse 27? Okay, two of you are, so that's good. The rest of you are in for a ride. Verse 27 says this, Religion that is pure and undefiled before God the Father is this, to visit orphans and widows in their affliction and to keep oneself unstained from the world. Religion that is pure and undefiled, truly, living, truly driven by love and for love of Jesus before God the Father is like unprocessed ore. Now, I did a tour of a potash mine once, and I can tell you sure enough that that unprocessed ore has junk mixed in with it, but it contains the precious raw materials that they're looking for, as it's pure and undefiled. Religion that is pure and undefiled before God the Father is a faith that leads to action. It's a faith that works. Not just bringing up ore from the earth, but processing it so it's useful, profitable, beautiful. The first way that faith leads to action is that it leads to a bridal tongue. The second way that faith leads to action is that it leads to visiting orphans and widows in their affliction. Now, what does that mean? The word visit in the Greek is this, and forgive me if I don't pronounce this wrong and you're a Greek-speaking person here, episkeptistai, epi meaning over, and skeptici to inspect, to go see, to visit. So episkeptici is to look upon, to visit, to go see, to exercise care for, to exercise oversight. It's where we get the term overseer or shepherd in the flock of God in the church. And in fact, this is a qualifying characteristic of leaders in the church. They look out for the, the flock. They care for and take care of and have concern for the flock. At this point, you might be tempted to, to think that it's easy to say, well, this visiting is only a function of leadership. But there's a problem with that. And it comes at the beginning of verse 1. Take a look if you have your app or your Bible open to it. Notice there are no disclaimers. Part of this book are only there for the overseer and pastor of your church. I don't see it. It's not there. To my beloved bivocational church planter, pastoral apprentice, and the interns. Do you see it? I don't. It actually says, to the 12 tribes in the dispersion, greetings. 
<laughs> Count it all joy, he continues, my brothers and sisters. The author calls us into gospel family relationships with one another, looking out for one another. He says it starts here in the church with us taking care of our widows and orphans, and then it may well spill into the streets. When you really believe that, when you truly hear it, as James has been saying, when you've been an orphan and Jesus has rescued you and brought you into his family as a full heir, you'll have a heart for orphans because you'll know what it's like to be one. We know what it's like to be left alone, to lose our loves as momentary as they may be, to become a spiritual widow, and then to have the best spouse step in and take care of us. Jesus does for us what we can never do for ourselves. And in doing so, we're now free to do for our gospel family what Jesus has done for us, doing out of done. The end of verse 27 says this, and to keep oneself unstained from the world. The first way that faith leads to action is that it leads to a bridled tongue. The second way that faith leads to action is that it leads to visiting orphans and widows and other members of the church family and their affliction. And it may even spill over to others. The third way that faith leads to action is that it leads to a holiness that isn't only public. Why is that? Well, because the world's way of doing things is to do something and make it about themselves. We humble brag online, we virtual signal through hashtags, we Instagram our practical works for the likes of strangers. But James is careful not to give the impression that a religion that's pleasing to God consists only of outward acts of practical compassion or social action. Yeah, the world is capable of acts of practical compassion, but the heart motivation is often self. Not so in the family of God, or at least it shouldn't be. Our response to this word should be doing out of what Jesus has already done in his perfect life, death, and resurrection. Doing out of what has been done. And it starts right here in our gospel family. How we love one another, how we forgive one another, how we speak to one another, how we visit the afflicted in our gospel family as Jesus has visited us, as we follow his example in how we live in our lives, even when no one is looking. This is God's people reflecting their father's nature in everyday life for his glory. Doers of the word, doing so out of what Jesus has done for us, motivated by this new covenant love relationship that Jesus has died to bring us into and empowers us to live out by the Holy Spirit.